Uh, good evening, everyone, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the National Security College at the Australian National University this evening. I'll begin tonight, as is traditional, at the ANU by paying my respects to the Ngunnawal people uh, and their elders past, present and emerging, on whose traditional lands uh, we are meeting this evening. Uh, the uh, the uh, National Security College is a unique joint venture between the Commonwealth Government and the ANU. Uh, and we take a, uh, an approach to national security which t attempts to bridge the worlds of academia and policy making and also that treats security um, in a very inclusive way, so it's more than just military matters. So you can imagine that we are quite thrilled to be launching um, in Canberra uh, a report that ticks both of those boxes this evening by our good friend and colleague from the Perth US Asia Centre, Dr Jeff Jeffrey Wilson. Uh, the report is Adapting Australia to an Era of Geoeconomic Competition. Um, so the way that we will uh, hold our proceedings this evening is we will hear first from Dr Wilson an overview of his report, uh, followed by uh, a reply from uh, Professor Anthea Roberts, uh, an ANU professor who I'll introduce in due course, uh, followed by an opportunity for Q&A with the audience. So if you've got questions, keep them in mind and we will get to them um, in the second half of the proceedings this evening. Um, I should also note that we are holding this event um, in COVID times so please do observe um, the social distancing rules that are set out uh, for you quite uh, markedly with the seat uh, uh, notices there for you as well. Um, but now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr Geoffrey Wilson from the Perth US Asia Centre. I should also acknowledge Professor Gordon Flake, the founding CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre, who's with us this evening as well. Um, Dr Geoffrey Wilson is the research director at the Perth US Asia Centre and an expert on all matters geoeconomic and in particular on the regional trade di uh, dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. So there is no better person uh, to be overviewing this report since you wrote it, but also uh, on this particular topic, we are very privileged to hear from you this evening, Dr. Wilson. Thank, thanks so much for the uh, that should be right. Thanks so much for the introduction, Catherine, and also thanks to this esteemed audience for coming out tonight. It's been a very long time due to our Federation's border closure since I've been either in Canberra or here at the National Security College. So it's really nice for the first time in 14 months that I've left Western Australia that the first trip could be back here and hosted with NSC. Really appreciate that. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to officially, not just Canberra, but nationally launch the Perth US Asia Centre's newest policy report um, entitled Adapting Australia to an Era of Geoeconomic Competition. Um, geoeconomic competition has become a fact of life in the early 21st century. As international rivalries amongst major powers have re-emerged, economic policies have become a more prominent element in the toolkit of contemporary statecraft. Trade warfare, investment races and competitive institution building, even cyber war, have all become very commonplace. And many governments are now deploying these geoeconomic weapons for strategic gain. What our report does is it attempts to locate Australia within this, within this new domain of global competition. Its point of departure is to recognise that geoeconomics poses serious challenges for both Australia's economic and national security interests. As an open economy, Australia critically depends on reliable trade and investment connections with the world. And as a medium-sized country, we realistically lack the scale to fight with the heavyweights when it comes to geoeconomic battles. So how can we best prepare Australia to manage emerging geoeconomic risks? Um, our report effectively asks four questions. What is geoeconomics and how does it work? Where is Australia most exposed to risk? What strategies have we deployed thus far and have they been effective? And what can we do to better prepare ourselves for geoeconomic contests in the future? This geoeconomics is very significant for Australia because our region, the Indo-Pacific, is the global epicentre of geoeconomic competition. As great power competition has re-emerged, governments have turned to using economic instruments to prosecute their rivalries. We've seen trade warfare, especially but not only by the Trump administration in the US, deployed to coerce rivals and friends. 
Infrastructure races have followed in the wake of China's one trillion US dollar Belt and Road Initiative, where governments have used infrastructure spending to build economic spheres of influence. Even multilateral diplomacy has become competitive, with dueling proposals for international institutions, um, such as the mega regional TPP and RCEP free trade agreements. So economics has, to some degree, become a proxy domain for strategic competition between the Indo-Pacific's major powers. So how do these strategies work? The operational logic of geoeconomics is that economic linkages between countries, such as trade, investment, people and information flows, carry more than just economic effects. They also have strategic implications for relationships of power by changing patterns of interdependence between countries. And as a result, economic linkages can be deliberately manipulated for strategic ends, such as creating dependence, coercing behaviour or establishing rules. Our report unpacks three mechanisms by which geoeconomics changes the nature of strategic relationships. Um, the first and most familiar to us is transactional diplomacy, where a government offers carrots or sticks to another to get what they want. Um, investment packages are a frequently used carrot, while trade sanctions, as we are familiar with in Australia, are a fairly common stick. Structural linkage is deeper, where longer-term economic ties are fostered in order to change patterns of dependence and interdependence. Free trade agreements and cross-border infrastructure, devices which more permanently tie economies together, fall into this category. Um, and political influence occurs when a government fosters political ties with interest groups in another country, with the aim of shaping that country's policy making or national debate. Um, the recent debates we've had in Australia about the uh, effects of foreign influence on our policy making is a familiar example to us here. But whatever the mechanism in question, what the concept of geoeconomics is telling us is that economics are, policies are, for better or worse, now a core part of the statecraft toolkit. Unfortunately, Australia is not especially tooled up for the types of geoeconomics that we're being exposed to. Um, since the 1980s, Australia has maintained what we could call a liberal foreign economic policy setting. This includes an advanced level of trade liberalisation, an open and market-based investment regime, and performance rather than politics-oriented trade program. Sorry, aid program. <laughs> now, these settings have certainly worked well in the past, and they were critical in allowing Australia to set a world record-setting 29-year recession-free run in 2019. But in an era of geoeconomic contests, these liberal settings are a decided liability. Trade openness and our low tariffs means Australia has limited ammunition to deploy during trade wars and a lot to lose when we do. A market-based investment regime prevents politically negotiated investment deals of the type that we've seen, say, in China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and a performance-oriented aid program goes, sees aid go to where it's most needed rather than where it's most politically expedient. So Australia suddenly finds itself an economic liberal in a world of economic realists. Indeed, we are highly exposed to geoeconomic risks. As a medium and open-sized economy, Australia has many critical trade investment linkages that become geoeconomic exposure points. Our challenge is also further compacted by a lack of diversity in our international economic ties. Um, Australia's highly concentrated trade profile, which we have up here on this graph, um, illustrates the challenge. Um, the Australian economy is very highly dependent on a small number of exports, predominantly natural resource or service products, which are themselves dependent on a very narrow set of trade partners, mostly in Asia. China, as you can see, looms especially large in this mix as the number one buyer of most of Australia's exports. And in a handful of cases, in products such as iron ore, bauxite, wool and timber, China is practically a monopsonist buyer. Now, these concentrated economic ties magnify our exposure to geoeconomic risks when they occur. When we're dependent on a handful of industries, which themselves each rely on a handful of customers, any potential problem that might occur at one of those linkage points carries an outside effect on our economic and strategic interests. And those problems are far from theoretical. Let me give you three um, 
recent examples about, of some of the geoeconomic risks Australia is being posed with, with alarming regularity. The first is the risk that Australia is, becomes a target for diplomatic coercion, geoeconomic style. Um, as I'm sure most in this audience are aware, this is exactly what's occurred in the China trade relationship in the last year. Um, between May and November in 2020, um, China exploited Australia's trade dependence to apply sanctions to 13 different industries in a clearly telegraphed reprisal for Australian diplomatic positions on issues such as COVID, the South China Sea disputes, Hong Kong and several other matters. While China has trade bashed many other countries before, the scale of the assault on Australia was quite staggering. Um, the affected industries exported $54 billion to China in 2019. And they, that trade accounts for 34% of our exports to China and 10% of our national exports overall, which are now subject to some form of sanctions. So gone are the days, if ever they existed, that Australia could keep its economic and diplomatic relationship with China on separate tracks. A second but often overlooked risk is the prospect that Australia could become collateral damage in the geoeconomic battles of others. And indeed, this too has already happened. Um, during the Trump administration, the US and China became entangled in one of the world's worst ever trade wars, with tariffs supplied to over 700 billion US dollars of bilateral trade. Now, the Australian government, with you may remember the help of Greg Norman, was able to secure a national security exemption from the US that moved us out of Trump's direct line of tariff fire. However, we have still suffered economic consequences. Um, as this value chain map from our report shows here, the ultimate destination for many of Australia's resource exports is actually the United States market, embodied in steel and aluminium and their products that are made in China between us and the final destination. So a US tariff on $35 billion of Chinese manufacturing products in the bottom right corner actually flows all the way back down the value chain and becomes an indirect tariff on $57 billion of Australian iron ore, coal and bauxite exports to China. Even when we're an innocent bystander, geoeconomic battles are likely to cost us. A third risk is that Australia could also be drawn into broader contests particularly within our region, when conducting our own diplomacy. Um, we discuss a number of different examples in the report, but perhaps the most pertinent is Australia's response to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, as our map shows, China's BRI has dispersed a quarter of a trillion US dollars of financing and contracts in the Indo-Pacific region since it was launched in 2014. But it's in the Pacific Islands that Australia's been most concerned. Risks have been identified regarding debt sustainability, um, the threat of possible dual-use infrastructure, and several cybersecurity risks affecting China-backed data centres and undersea internet cables in the Pacific. Um, the Australian government responded with its Pacific Step Up program of 2017, which has since directed support to several infrastructure projects in the Pacific that were designed in order to displace these competing Chinese proposals. While arguably warranted, the Pacific step up does pose its own political complications. It has geopoliticised Australia's aid program, which up until this point had hitherto emphasised developmental outcomes as their, its primary objective. It also means that Australia is now engaged in direct competition with China's BRI in the Pacific, which becomes a clear political liability when managing bilateral ties with our top trade partner. So, with geoeconomic risks a real and present danger, what can Australia better do to manage this landscape? Um, we argue that a business as usual approach won't work. Our liberal policy settings were mostly put in place over three decades ago, when economic cooperation rather than conflict was the global norm. So unless we make changes now, geoeconomic conflicts will leave Australia dangerously exposed to political risks. To begin the policy reform discussion, our report concludes by laying out five principles that can productively inform new geoeconomics-ready approaches. Um, while these aren't necessarily an exhaustive list, they map out the art of a practical for how a medium-sized open economy like Australia can effectively respond to geoeconomics. Um, first and foremost is to build more diversity into our trade and investment ties. 
If concentration magnifies risk, diversity builds resilience. And having a broader range of both sectors and partners in the mix will minimise the impact of shocks when they occur. We also need to invest in defensive capabilities. As 2020 painfully revealed, Australia has been and will be subject to economic coercion. Um, we need to develop both domestic and international strategies to manage the costs of this coercion when it occurs again. However, we should also get on the front foot. Australia may not have the resources of a great power like the US or China, but we are the world's 13th largest economy and we're the sixth largest in the Indo-Pacific. And as the Pacific Step-Up program shows, Australia certainly has geoeconomic levers that can be pulled. Um, perhaps our greatest assets, our ability to build international institutions, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that can shape the global economic order in favourable ways. But to build these institutions, we need to work with friends. International coalitions are a force multiplier, and our best diplomatic results have typically come when working with others. Given the nature of great power rivalries today, it's likely these co coalitions will in the future be mini-lateral rather than multilateral, composed of like-minded friends that share our interest in a rules-based economic order. And finally at home, geoeconomics is going to force us to think differently about how we make foreign policy decisions themselves. It can no longer be the sole preserve of DFAT or defence. The complexities of geoeconomics means that a much wider range of agencies will need to move towards the centre of the policymaking process, and businesses who are on the front line of geoeconomic conflicts will need to be brought into the room far more than they have. So in sum, we argue that the geoeconomic contests are a fact of life in the 21st century, are already posing real threats to Australia's economic and security interests, and are unfortunately not likely to go away anytime soon. But there are things Australia can do. Careful and calibrated changes to our foreign policy outlook, settings and processes can get us ready to manage these risks in the future. Or in other words, now's the time for Australia to adapt itself for an era of geoeconomics. Um, and there's a link to our report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. It's now my pleasure to invite up to give a replying remark, Professor Anthea Roberts. Uh, professor Anthea Roberts is a professor here at the ANU, is a global expert on international uh, public law, uh, international economic law, international comparative law, and the effects of uh, geopolitical change on global governance. She was named 2019's leading international law scholar and uh, domestic Australian law scholar as well, but most relevantly for our present purposes, leads the geoeconomic working group uh, at the ANU, uh, which is, again, like the college, uh, like the National Security College, really bridging uh, academia and uh, policy making. So it's uh, my great privilege to welcome uh, Anthea uh, to provide a reply. Can we go back one to this one? Great. Well, thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for the presentation of the report. This is an excellent and timely report dealing with something which is very much in the minds of policymakers and very much on the front pages of our newspapers and very much in the minds of the corporate boardroom. So I think this is a very timely report and very well done. What I want to do in this short uh, discussion of the report is three things. The first thing is I want to zoom in on the idea about what makes Australia and Australian companies vulnerable. The second thing I want to do is zoom out to think about how do we take a systems level perspective on these issues. And the final thing I want to do is talk about the importance of taking integrative approaches. So let me walk those through in turn. The first is to zoom in about what it is that makes a country vulnerable. And here I want to go to the first recommendation, which is to diversify economic relationships to reduce risk exposure. So one of the things that the report does very well is it identifies where we have strong exports that are very concentrated and how this provides risk. Now, it is true that if you have strong exports that are very concentrated, that does contribute towards risk. But I think it's also important that we actually bury down into those particular different sectors to think about the number of things that you need together in order for that risk to actually be substantial in your particular area. 
So concentration is absolutely one of the things that you should be thinking about. But another thing that you should be thinking about is whether or not the other party actually has a dependence on you. There are some things like iron ore where Australia has a very concentrated sale to China, but they are much less vulnerable because China is very dependent on those sales coming from us because they are not able to diversify in terms of where they buy these sorts of materials from. So first we look at, at concentration, then we look at relative levels of dependence on both sides of the equation. The next thing I think that we look at is whether or not we have alternative buyers in a particular market. Because we know in some of these areas, even if we have concentration, we may be able to shift those products to other markets. And some, sometimes we can find ready and willing and able buyers, and sometimes we can't. And that will differ depending on what it is. We may, in time, be able to find buyers for our coal in a way that, in a very short way, we cannot find buyers for our crayfish. And that leads me to a third thing as we start to pass these different sectors, which is about choke points. One of the some of the researchers we have here are looking at really interesting examples of where, for example, China has used geoeconomic strategies to sort of choke some of the tourism that was going into South Korea, for example. And in one year, they were able to reduce that from 8 million down to 4 million. The reason that they weren't able to reduce it from 8 million down to zero is that 4 million was done through tour operators and 4 million was done directly to customers, to consumers. And it turns out when you have tour operators, they act as a leverage point that you can put pressure on and that makes them much, much easier to kind of turn off the tap than doing it at a retail level with every consumer. And so I think this is a wonderful example about how when we start to uh, sort of do this sector by sector, we can start to sort of go in a much more granular way about where it is concentration is, first of all, that creates our risk, but secondly, where it is that we may have greater risk or less risk. And that is also going to be very important when we think about what sort of capacities we want to be addressing those risks. Some of them, we think about adaptive capacity and adaptive very much in the title. Sometimes you want to take preventative measures. Sometimes if you can actually, um, in a market, find alternative buyers, you can take adaptive measures after the fact without an enormous amount of cost. And sometimes you want to take transformative measures. And I think one of the other things that really is striking from the list of areas that we have great concentration is just how many of them are not in high tech or science related fields. And so one of the questions that we have in the longer term is not just how do we protect the economy that we have now, but how do we transform the economy to be what we want it to be in the future? And this time question is something that is very often raised by Professor Rory Medcalf, and I think is a really interesting part of this. So I think that this report gives us a wonderful basis for zooming in in that kind of way. So now forgive me as I zoom out. So what I want to do when I think about zooming out is to sort of say that we need to start analysing these issues on a systems level. Because whenever you look at any individual thing that happens, often the relationship as a whole is more than the sum of the parts. And so as we see all of the individual sectors that have been hit, it's not that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. In this case, it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 might equal 10. And that's because in a complex relationship, you can actually have feedback loops that build on each other in sort of sometimes almost exponential ways. And you can have phase changes in relationships. We know this when we think about the difference between going up one degree at a time in temperature, and yet at some point, water boils over or water freezes. And I think part of what we've seen in the Australia-China relationship is many incremental one degree, one degree, one degree, actually getting to a point where you could either think that the relationship in 2020 boiled over or that some of it has gone into the freezer, as Rory likes to say sometimes. But once we start to take that more systems level analysis, then we need to realise that the geoeconomic competition is an incredibly important part of that, but it's part of multiple other trends that are happening. So let me just identify two that I think are really important. The first is that the security approach as a qualification on the neoliberal trade agenda is an extremely important push back against some of the neoliberal ideology that we saw in the last three decades. But it's not the only pushback that is happening. And so part of the work that we're doing here is to map 
m multiple areas of pushback, be they left-wing populism because there is a concern that too much has gone to the rich, be they concerns about corporate power because of the level of concentration to corp certain corporations, be they right-wing populism that's concerned about manufacturing having gone offshore or immigration coming onshore, or uh, be they sustainability, which is how we can have ended up in the kind of environmental mess that we have ended up in. I think policymaking in the next generation will often depend on where you actually have overlaps between, for example, geoeconomics and protectionism or geoeconomics and environmental issues. And so one of the things we need to start mapping are these different policy drivers which are all challenging the traditional neoliberal economic consensus, but often pull us in different directions and may support different policies and different kinds of alliances. So I think that's really important work to do. And once you take that multi-issue approach, you also need to take a multi-perspective analysis. Imagine we take this report, which does the geoeconomic consideration from an Australian perspective, and we now do this report from the perspective of a geoeconomic report from China's perspective, and from America's perspective, and from Singapore's perspective, to just take three examples. What we can start to see from those different perspectives is that your concerns and your overlap of some of these areas may look very different. And it may be that some of the sectors, for example, that China is targeting with us, may be, may be because they want to retaliate in certain ways, but they may also be because of their own protectionist concerns, their own concerns to want to diversify some of their industries, to prop up some of their industries. So I think once we start to take these sort of multi-issue and multi-perspective approaches, it makes things much more complex. But I think it will give us some sort of a guidance to how we think about policy making going forward. And that's what leads me to my third point, which is integrative approaches. What we have seen, I think, in the last few decades and longer, is we have seen an approach that says the way to understand things is to simplify and silo. We create economics departments, we create political science departments, we create uh, people that do computing. And we do the same at a government department level as well. What we are seeing in the 21st century is that the big challenges we have, whether they are geoeconomic competition or climate change or some of the massive inequalities that we're seeing, they are reconfiguring our intellectual map where the real action is not in any one of these silos, but is at the intersection of multiple silos. And the problem with that is we do not have the structures to think about how to integrate across domains. And this goes very much to the last point on Jeff's slides. We need to think about ways as a policymaker to integrate different perspectives, but also as educators, as researchers. And that's one of the really interesting things about something like what we're seeing with the National Security College in its new masters, is that when you take a concept like national security, and we now know, particularly over the last year, how much that is a concept that has brought in health pandemics, bushfires, geoeconomics, so very broad sectors, well outside traditional military and um, interstate conflicts. It's at those spaces that the integration starts to happen. But we don't really have yet very strong tools, I think, in our departments or in our universities about how we make that integration happen. I'm reminded here of the work of Howard Gardner, who was the person that came up with the eight multiple intelligences. And he says, not only are there eight multiple intelligences, but there are different kinds of minds. One type of mind is the disciplining mind. You know economics, you know security, you know the environment. We have those minds. What we don't have is the synthesizing mind. People and processes and educational opportunities and government departments that help to synthesize and bring them together. And that's what I think we need for 21st century risks. And that is something that this report is pushing us towards doing. Thank you. I'd now like to invite you back to the stage, Anthea, and also Jeff, uh, for a Q&A session. So what I will do uh, is take the chair's prerogative here. I've got two questions I want to put to you both first, and then if others in the audience have questions, um, start thinking about those now. But my first question uh, to you both, and starting with you, uh, Jeff, is 
It's around the who. So one of the rubs of geoeconomics is that it is foreign policy, it is geopolitics playing out at the level of businesses, of the private sector and of enterprise. And when we come to formulating a response, uh, often the, uh, the, the, the units who are caught in the crosshairs of geoeconomics, as it were, are ordinary people, they're ordinary businesses. Uh, they might be suffering collateral damage as a result of the foreign policy decisions of their government. Uh, who do you want to take action um, to adapt or respond or defend to the new ge geoeconomic world order? Is it for governments or businesses? And, and how do you make businesses uh, follow the rule of government when we live in a, a market um, mm -hmm. economy? I, th I think this is one of the almost pernicious aspects of adapting to geoeconomic competition, is if you face a traditional security threat, your toolkit is your military. If you face a non-traditional security threat, it might be aid agencies, it might be, we've seen in past, disaster relief activities, even health pandemics and that kind of thing. When it comes to geoeconomics, the businesses are the frontline troops, for better or worse. They often don't know they are, they don't want to be, they would like this to all go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's sometimes resentful. But they're also, in, particularly in systems like Australia's political economic system, outside of the realm of government. And, you know, as we've seen in some of the debates over what's happened with China trade last year, quite capable of having an independent voice on these issues that may not share the government's view of a security risk assessment, for example. Um, this is also important because different countries have a different set of government business relations that are able to manage that. Um, certainly one of the reasons China's able to launch something like the Belt and Road Initiative that no one else could do is not its fiscal reserves to do so, but the presence of large state-owned enterprises in the construction, steel, aerospace sectors who can, through, as state-owned enterprises, be ordered to build a bridge in Indonesia. If the, the Australian government would love if we could do that with our construction <laughs> companies, please go and do it. Um, now, but China's certainly not, that, that, that's a very pertinent example, but it's not the only um, country that has those toolkits. So partially when we say that Australia's not tooled up, one of the tools that we don't lack are government business relationships that actually allow that discussion to go along. It is a function of our liberal settings, they've worked well, but now we find ourselves in a situation where a number of businesses in those 13 industries have carried the cost for Australian foreign policy this year and rightly have questions to ask as to, well, how are we in Australia going to distribute that cost? Why weren't we in the room when decisions were made that led to it? So I think one of the tooling ups we have to do is rethink what the state market relationship is going to look like when these things continue to happen in the future. And are we ready for that conversation? I imagine if I'm a business sitting somewhere, as people in Canberra merrily talk about kind of recasting state market relations, I might be feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Well, how do you bring business into that? conversation. Are they already there after 2020? Um, after 2020, they're already there. It's not always a pleasant conversation after 2020 either. Um, and I think this is something that's new. It's also something with some of the trade issues we've had in the last 12 months that happened as a result of a crisis. It wasn't happening, something bad happened, and suddenly we have to get in the room and deal with it. So when we talk about, you know, you coming up with defensive mechanisms to deal with geoeconomics, that fundamentally means having those conversations before there's a crisis, before something's on fire, we can actually work some of those things out and to pick up on some of the kinds of resilience that we're talking about, do things preemptively so when these things happen, that relationship's established, you don't have to. There were certainly some in instances where early in the year when barley was sanctioned, everyone was going, can we get a list of all the barley farmers? Because no one knew who they were and we were involved in ringing around to farmers in Kelleberran in Western Australia. Do you sell barley to China? <laughs> um, well, well, this is just some of the, uh, one of the defensive capabilities is doing that homework and understanding mm. where the risks are. Not necessarily doing anything about them necessarily, but having the relationship and the information at hand so you're ready to move much faster when it does happen. Anthea, I want to bring you in here and, and ask you a slightly different question, which is we are accepting that we live in a new geoeconomic world order. We are accepting that in some sense the neoliberalism that has guided Australia is no longer entirely fit for purpose. To what extent um, should Australia um, accept this as the new normal and adapt by developing its own geoeconomic toolkit versus what value is there and what vestiges of that neoliberal free and open order can we save and should we be uh, pushing uh, back against those who are, um, I guess, turning to a more geoeconomic centred toolkit to achieve their national and foreign policy objectives? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think 
question and a really good example of the sort of difference between the transactional thinking and the systemic thinking, right? So the transactional thinking, I think, would often make you think about a particular geoeconomic activity and should we sort of respond and be defensive and what do we do in that case? The systemic one then actually asks sort of what sort of a system do we have and what sort of a system do we want to promote? And I think part of the disconnect that we're seeing, I think, in the policy community is it's not just that um, some of the policy community were very committed to the neoliberal order. It's that they want to be a drag effect on some of these geoeconomic tendencies. They want to, to say, yes, it may not be that we have exactly the same neoliberal ones, but we, we don't want to escalate these geoeconomic tendencies because these geoeconomic tendencies are coming and being pushed by, you know, China and the US, which are both much stronger powers and much better equipped to play in this game. We're a much smaller one, we're much more sort of open, we're much more exposed, and as a middle power, we want to have international rules based up. And so I think a, a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is a concern about not wanting to do things that lead to that boiling over, when the system level, they accept needs some changing, but they don't want it to change radically. But I think we're also not at a position where we're going to be the ones setting what those new agendas are. So I think it's going to be very hard, for example, when we think about like-minded allies, very, very hard for the US to sign on to trade agreements that look like they used to look like. And that's not just because of China. That's also because of the domestic protectionist push. It's also because of the corporate power concerns. It's also because of the left-wing populist concerns. And many of those concerns are actually not as strong in Australia. And so I think one of the things that we need to be thinking about is I don't think we're going to go back to where we were. I don't think we want to go fully to a geoeconomic world order. And yet, I think we do need to work out something which will be a recalibration that's not really driven as much by our politics, but by the domestic politics we see in a bunch of other leading countries. Uh, that's, that's fascinating and a good point to open it up to um, broader conversation. Um, I just invite you, if you've got a question, put your hand up. We have some mics in the room and they will come around to you. Um, feel free to kind of say where you're from and ask a short, sharp question with a question mark, hopefully, at the end. <laughs> One in the middle. Good day, thanks. My name is Mark Sawyers. I'm Anthony Albanese's Foreign Affairs and National Security Advisor. So I, I come to this as a policy, uh, a policy thinker. I was very impressed by your idea about systems thinking and, and the sort of integrative thinking that we need to engage in. Um, I wanted to ask whether you can point to examples in, in the foreign policy and national security community where you think that's actually happening and happening well. Um, I'm very conscious we need to find those models very quickly and start adapting them to them and, and uh, creating them and rolling them out. So I'd be interested if you could point to any. Uh, just as an aside, as a student of public administration in, in the dim distant past, I can also point to another area of pushback in the sort of neoliberal kind of thinking about governance. And in the, in the public policy literature, of course, there's a strong focus now on collaborative governance. So, you know, if we're, if we're looking for theoretical ideas, that's a nice place to, to look as well. But anyway, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to take two or do you want a response? If we, if we got a second? There was a... Oh, yes, Professor Bell. Thank you. Um, Sharon Bell, I'm the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I wanted to pick up on the question of the role of business in this space. In the context that the most recent Edelman Trust Index showed some really interesting new change developments. One is that business is purportedly one of the most trusted sectors now. Um, and you know, you, governments less so, academics and scientists less so also. But the interesting thing, the telling thing and the relevant thing about business is that it's trust in businesses you know, trust in businesses with whom you have relationship. And so I want to pick up in this complex systems approach, where does that question of relationship come in and how do we actually factor those dynamics into our thinking about um, the, the ecosystems that we're, we're dealing with? Well, Might start with Anthea yeah. first and then go to... <laughs> um, 
So I don't yet have good examples of where I'm finding this. And the reason I say that is that we're actually starting a course next week um, teaching at the National Security College on leadership, risk, and crisis management. And the, the purpose of the course is actually to try and develop these frameworks that make us think about how do we think about risk and resilience across a variety of threats and hazards. We take in everything from climate change and um, bushfires through to COVID, through to geoeconomic risk, through to some of the traditional sort of national security concerns like terrorism. To try and start to build these integrative frameworks, I can tell you through the preparation of that that I have not found it anywhere, but that is where we're hoping to go with this. And I think it's something that we, we can clearly see we need it in policy making. But I think your idea that you may be able to find ideas from elsewhere is absolutely on point. So for example, some of the best thinking that we're finding to transport across into the geoeconomic domain about resilience is actually coming from the environmental disaster management area. And these are communities that usually just don't speak at all. So I think there's a real possibility for that cross-pollination. Um, on your one, I mean, I think it's such, it's such a beautiful point because the, the, dif the difference about going to the systems level, to the ecosystem, is relationality and interaction is an enormous part of it, as are unintended consequences from, from things that are connecting or, or things that are breaking apart. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot of shifts in those relationships at the moment. So there may be a lot of trust in certain businesses, but I think there's become heightened distrust of some of our social media businesses. I also think that the kind of relationships that we have between state and market are not just different between different countries. So traditionally people think of, you know, state and market being more separated in our economies, more together in the Chinese economy. What I'm clearly seeing at the moment is that those state market relationships are changing in quite fundamental ways. And I think that the level of distrust you had from Silicon Valley a decade ago towards DC, DC compared to the, to the sidling up and lobbying that we're seeing now, sort of tells you that these relationships are, are really adapting and that we need to have that sort of an adaptive approach. So I think the, to go back to your broader policy making, the reason I like adapting in the title is we think of this as a broader idea of adaptive governance because of how uncertain and predictable the world is with all of these interconnections and relationships. Some really interesting questions there. Just on the relationship side, I think part of, to narrow it down to Australia here, one of Australia's challenges, a particular ideology about what a government, government business relationship should look like for some time. Um, this kind of came with new public management in the 1980s. Um, I'm sure many in, who've been in the Commonwealth Public Service, particularly of maybe a slightly older generation, remember the yellow pages theory of government. If you can buy it in the yellow pages, government doesn't do it. Um, and al also notions of the, re the regulatory state is that the state's role in the economy is to sit as a rulemaking arbiter and you leave the market to that. Indeed, when government had relationships with businesses that were denser than here, are the rule we've drawn out the borders and you guys play inside, that then put you at risk of regulatory capture. You could have rent seeking around getting access to grants or all kinds of things. And there's certainly a generation of Commonwealth public servants who are raised to not to make rules for business, don't actually talk to any of them because it's a risk when you do, that you're intervening in a market and worst, at worst, you, best you could pick a loser, at worst you could be subject to regulatory capture. Um, that ideology is much more prominent in Australia than this is in most other countries. China, this is equally true of Japan, it's equally true of Indonesia, it's equally true of the United States and Europe. Um, and so when Australia goes into these situations, we have a set of settings that achieved certain goals and weren't necessarily ineffective at what they were trying to achieve, but they're not fit for purpose for some of the challenges we see when others have that relationship. They don't have ideologies that governments should steer clear of business on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's part of the challenge and it's, it's why this will be a hard adaptation for Australia because it runs up against previous ideologies of what the role of the state in the economy should be. Uh, Mark, just on your example about where do we do this, I actually think this kind of thing is probably the norm for a lot of Australian policy making, um, and it partially reflects foreign policy as being a rarefied space that's kind of been separated, but also that, that things have changed when we're in a competition setting rather than a cooperation setting. So like a, a classic example for this would be how Australia's trade diplomacy worked as late as five years ago. Um, we would find a trade a large country in Asia that we thought we could trade more with than we presently were, 
DFAT trade division would go around industry and say, who's selling to Indonesia or China? What things have tariffs on them you would like us to get down? What stuff aren't you selling that you'd like us to sell more of? They'd do workshops and roadshows. Come out to Perth and they'd do one here with us in Perth. Um, they'd get a big list. That would be called your offensive demands. You'd go to your negotiations and through 34 rounds of negotiation, you would turn, do yours. The other side would do theirs. We'd hammer it down. And then once it was all done, we'd sign an FTA and go back to business and say, you asked for 10 things and we got five of them. The problem with this is that, that it was a very arm's length relationship and it was, it was almost transactional in the communication style. Tell us what you want, we'll go out and get it for you and bring you back as much as we can. Um, the kind of relationships we're talking about here require a huge level of density understanding and to, to integrate my answer to the previous question, actually collapsing that relationship as how foreign economic policy works. It's when we, we're not the hunter-gatherer going and killing a boar and bringing it back for our business sector. And so I think after 20 or 30 years of that being what trade policy meant to Australia, having to change into this more defensive mode and deal with a, oh God, Bali's been hit, what do we do now? It's a real cultural change for the way that space operates, but I don't think it's necessarily against how we can do things in other, in other sectors, but it does require stepwise thinking in, well, what's... And the same is true of investment, the same is true of institution building, the same is true of cyber security, right? All of these things are asking us to think about the modality of government differently to what we were used to and worked well. Quick repost from Anthea. <laughs> yeah, so I was just, just going to pick up on one bit, which is um, when we're in a sort of a cooperative frame versus when we're in a competitive frame. And I think one of the things I get from some of the systems thinking is that quite often you're cooperative and you're competitive, but at different levels of the analysis. So the easiest way to think about this is with sports teams, you compete with somebody else to get onto the sports team, but then when you're on the sports team, you cooperate with each other so you can compete with other sports teams. But those sports teams that are all in basketball effectively are cooperating with each other so that they get more money goes to basketball versus soccer. And so what quite often you, you compete at one level to, co sorry, you cooperate at one level to compete at another level We've got time for one more round of questions, so if anyone else has something they'd like to throw into the mix, <coughs> Professor Flake, and then one more over here. So I'm really taken by your, your, your sports analogy, and I want to kind of ask <laughs> Jeff's opinion on this, right? Because <laughs> if you're a, a liberal international trade purist, you don't believe in teams, right? You believe in most for every nation for everybody, everybody's a thing. So I'm kind of curious, would you respond to that analogy uh, in the context of what you said at the outset, that we're in an environment where we've got a toolkit that's set up for a liberal area, era when people are moving into a more competitive era? And in particular, I'm interested in what are the teams that Australia is being asked to join and should we join them? Mm. Thanks, Gordon. And Anthony, you, might, you, you, you may have a view on my response here. I think you're right that the purpose of a liberal era in the global economy, roughly from the end of the Cold War till quite recently, the purpose was to get rid of teams. Um, we all, we, the World Trade Organization expands from a small group of Western countries, which is what it starts at, to be 183 members now, like the, the, everyone's in it. We're supposedly all on the same footing. And so very much the point of that was to try and eliminate multi-level competition as it happened, and we see this with the whole global economic architecture. You name an economic issue, there's a global institution in Geneva that supposedly works on it, which is, we're all one team. Um, what's, what this is kind of marking is that the team logic is coming back once you see that. So there's both the individual competition, but then once the multi-level thing comes in, you go, okay, well, a country like Australia might not do so well competing on our own, but we can chuck up with a couple of others and then we become competitive at a different level. Um, 
Part of the reason that we rec recommend mini-lateral is that because of those levels of descensus, often the grouping is going to be smaller. Um, the utter stasis and paralysis in the World Trade Organization in the last decade is a function of its 183 members who range from the very large to the very small, the very underdeveloped to the very wealthy, and a whole range of things in between. And establishing consensus in that group is not going to work, given that once we have this overlay. Um, but something like the World Trade Organization has the single undertaking. Nothing is agreed until 183 agree. And so for 20 years, nothing has been agreed. <laughs> um, when we say that, we need to think about what those coalitions of friends are. Um, I think for Australia, part of our, our, our muscle memory response has to been to go to the US. Then Trump came along and he was the worst at doing all of this, using trade wars to punish everyone. And we went, oh, well, what do we do? We kind of waited and got Greg Norman to get the phone number. Um, once that was over with, now Biden's back, we'll go back to the US. But this really is an opportunity to not just diversify trade, but actually diversify who you think your partners are. Depending on what the issue is, it could be different. Um, Japan has been a long-standing partner. There's a lot of stuff on the economic front we could do with Vietnam, which is bizarrely the most pro-free trade country in Asia at the moment, <laughs> um, midwifing the RCEP trade agreement at the ASEAN summit last year. Um, so the, the specific constellation of who that is is different, but it's probably going to mean for Australia or our partners that the, the feasible set group is going to be 5 or 10, not 25 or 183. It's quick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think part of what's, and this is one way you see an economic issue and a security issue are perhaps somewhat separate, is that I think that, that we're all being sort of playing football, but, but the Western states have been playing soccer type football, and the, the, the Chinese have been playing gridiron type football, right? And they're, they're all turning up on the same team, playing, trying to play the same game without saying, oh, well, it's all football, but actually they're playing very different games, and the reality is that's partly why we can't agree on rules at the World Trade Organization. Soccer players will start playing differently if they're on the field with gridiron players. They will start putting on helmets, they'll start putting on shin pads, they'll start putting third balls and all the rest of it. So part of what we're having happen at the moment is that we haven't been playing all the same game. And that's not just a security issue, that's a that's a kind of an economic issue. But also if you do want to then have say, look, everybody over here on the field play play with me, we're gonna play soccer, you guys play gridiron over there. That kind of works on some things when you think about like five G, right? Where you do want to be with your like minds. But on many trade issues, part of the whole point is that you don't want to be with your like-minded because you want to have you want to be complementary to each other. And so some of the logic that allows us to come together in some of the security field doesn't give us the economic logic to come together in the trade area. And that's I don't have an answer to that, but that that's part of the concern. It's a sign of the times that you come to the National Security College for a talk about economics and leave with a wealth of sporting metaphors. Um, we, push that, we, we pushed that metaphor just then, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we've got one final question uh, over here. Hi, uh, my name's Laurie Phillips. I work at DFAT. Um, I have a bit more of a uh, niche question. Um, I work in the aid program. I've been working in the Middle East aid program, but also in mm. Southeast Asia and in China. Um, I'm interested in the way that you describe the pressures on our aid program as it's being moved from results-based, needs-based, to more politically expedient. Um, do you think this is actually a positive development in the current environment of geoeconomic competition? I'm just wondering if you can unpack that a little bit, because noting in my experience, um, the actual results-based and effectiveness-based uh, aspect of our aid program is actually a comparative advantage compared to, say, some, like some other competitors like uh, Belt and Road Initiative and things such as that. I want to give Jeff the final word. Mm. So, Anthea, okay. do you want to... Okay. Oh, this one's All okay. yours. <laughs> There's a long-standing debate in aid policy about whether good governance aid policies that are, a, you know, use yardsticks of performance and effectiveness genuinely live up to that. And any aid professional's got a, a diary full of war stories about the project that was supposed to go a certain way until a political dynamic meant something had to get, some barnacle got cobbled onto it. Um, but the general principle that, you know, a country gives aid for its development outcomes in terms of programming, priority, that's the goal, and then when politics gets in the way, that becomes exceptions to a rule. Geoeconomics fundamentally changes that. The politics becomes the rule. Um, and we certainly see this in the way a country like China, Japan, others in the region that use aid have always had a more strategic view of that. 
it's always been targeted at countries that they are attempting to achieve political goals from far more than ours. We probably had one of the most performance-oriented aid programs in many countries, certainly in the OECD. Um, and what we see is, while we maintain that, there are a lot of arguments for it. In the environment we find ourselves, well, if you're waiting for the business case for a particular piece of critical infrastructure in a particularly important country where there is a particularly worrisome alternate option on the table, if you're waiting for that to make a commerciality business case, and what happens when it doesn't stack up? Do you go, well, yeah, OK, but we could do a rural infrastructure building dikes for local rice paddies or something instead, because the cost-benefit analysis says that's the best thing to improve incomes in that country. That, if you are a purist about that principle, you effectively lose that race. I think the challenge for me, and a lot of that, the implications of that worry me, that you then end up becoming institutional isomorphism. You, we become like that which we're concerned about, which, that which we criticise. But it is a spectrum, neither, neither exists in pure form. And I think as we have to sign, sort of digest some of those issues, those questions have been raised by what Australia has done through the Pacific Step Up. It will continue to happen as that moves across the rest of the development assistance program outside the Pacific. What we need to do is keep our eyes open to the fact that there is a trade-off there and genuinely weigh those costs rather than lurching from one extreme to another with consequences for the genuine human benefit that the aid program is offering that can't get lost in the wash. Um, thank you. I will now invite um, Professor Rory Medcalf, who's the head of the National Security College, um, to provide uh, the concluding remarks for this evening. Look, thank you, uh, thank you, Catherine, and um, I'm going to keep this really short and sweet. This was, I think, a really dynamic uh, and illuminating conversation, and I think we've had an hour. We could have gone on, but I encourage you all to read closely the, uh, the report, and I know that I believe the report is available online, Jeff. Um, so read, read closely the report that Jeff Wilson has authored. Uh, I guess my own reflections on this are that um, I, I recall quite recently in, I think in December, I was with a, uh, you know, sort of a Chatham House uh, discussion with a lot of uh, leading Australian policy commentators and we were sort of grappling with the question, how did we do, how did Australia do in 2020? And I actually thought it was the wrong question. I think the right question, and it's the right question right now, is how are we preparing? Because a lot of the issues uh, that Jeff's report has uh, really explored, and I think that the discussion with, uh, with Anthea so the, ha, has really unpacked, are about how Australia or other countries are preparing for a much more disrupted future where those boundaries have broken down between uh, security and economics, where geoeconomics is going to remain uh, a lever of, of influence, so a lever of statecraft. And I think, uh, Jeff, to look at your report, uh, you, you, you've identified quite admirably a toolkit uh, that we need for that national preparation. And I know, uh, sort of speaking earlier today with uh, Professor Gordon Flake, uh, the, uh, the head of your centre, the US Asia Centre in Perth, that it's this moment of opportunity for Australian governments that is absolutely crucial. It's how we use the shock of, uh, I guess, COVID, uh, the Chinese coercion and, of course, climate as well, to really start revisiting the, the nature of our economy, the way we uh, really build collaborative policy making, uh, integrating business into a national response. I think that's the crucial question that I hope this evening's conversation has really driven forward for us all and for, I hope, uh, government policy makers uh, and perhaps those in opposition as well who are, who are, um, who are listening. So, look, thank you. I want to, um, again, um, thank Professor Bell, um, Professor Sharon Bell, the Dean of the College of Asia and Pacific here at ANU for being with us here tonight as well, uh, reflecting, I think, high-level support from ANU for what we're trying to do. This is um, an example of the work the National Security College does to really drive that inclusive national conversation. Uh, we're very happy to partner with an institution uh, from the other side. Um, thanks for making the journey over from Perth, but the Perth US Asia Centre uh, does fantastic work on Indo-Pacific uh, security, geoeconomics, diplomacy and the lot. We're very proud to partner with you because I think the challenges Australia faces clearly need that inclusive national response.
of partnership. So please join me now uh, in thanking, in, in particular, our, um, our visiting author of the report, uh, Dr Geoffrey Wilson, but also Professor Anthea Roberts of ANU, who will be leading, as you'll see uh, in the next year or two, uh, a really uh, expanded geoeconomics program that I think will build on, um, on Jeff's excellent work. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>